If you were trapped in the mountains of Sweden with a deadly creature, what would you do? No one can hear you scream, and you'll have to stay grounded in reality if you want to make it out of here alive. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the evil god in the ritual. <laughs> These guys are in for the ride of their lives. At a local pub, this group of men discuss the destination for their next boys trip. The group suggests a bunch of places they used to party at when they were younger, but one friend, Robert, tells them he wants to go hiking in the Swedish mountains. Some of them agree, but Luke here completely rejects the idea. Outside, they're still throwing around the hiking idea when Luke spots a liquor store. He asks if anyone wants to keep on drinking. No one's interested, but Robert goes into the store with him while the rest get ready to go home. Walking inside, Luke confirms confronts him about the state of their group. Everyone's getting older, and he tells them that it's harder to have a good time like when they used to. Robert doesn't agree, and says there's nothing wrong with settling down. Suddenly, they notice an injured woman crouched behind the counter. The back door slams open, and two junkies walk out, demanding to know where the rest of the money is. Terrified, Luke hides behind the shelves, while Robert stays put. The junkies notice him and tell the man to hand over his wallet. He reluctantly gives it to them, but they keep asking for more. He hands over his watch, but they're not satisfied. The junkie slashes his face with a machete, and he falls to the ground. Luke has no idea what to do and freezes up, while the junkies take the rest of his friend's belongings. Robert glances at Luke before the junkie cracks his skull. That makes one down, with four more to go. Coming soon to a theater near you, how to beat official Patreon. All the guts, all the blood, all the screams, plus nasty extras. How to beat Patreon. Two times the shock, two times the terror, two times the subscription levels. Have a damn good day, and it only gets better. Both levels bid you welcome to pre-sales for ghoulish official How to Beat merchandise and support the evil scientists behind the How to Beat videos. It only gets better subscribers are invited to the X-rated party. Ad-free and uncensored videos too repulsive for all audiences are available on demand. How to Beat's Patreon. In space, no one can hear you scream. But on Patreon, everyone can see you bleed. How to beat Patreon. Join us if you dare. Six months later, Luke wakes up in a tent and walks out to take in the mountains of Sweden. One by one, his friends wake up and get ready for another day of hiking. Walking along the trail, the guys find themselves a good vantage point to leave a memorial for Robert. Hutch gives a few words and whips out a flask. Everyone takes a swig for their fallen friend, and Hutch pours out the rest in memorial. That night, they set up camp, and Hutch notices that Luke's been acting a bit distant. He approaches him and tells him that their friend's death wasn't his fault. Looking off in the distance, they see the lodge they're heading to. It's closer than they think, but they're about to realize that it's a much more difficult journey than they're expecting. The next day, the group sets off to the lodge, but Dom slips and twists his leg on the trail, but they tell him there's still six more hours until the next stop. They give him a rod to walk with and continue their journey across the mountains. Before they head off, Hutch reveals that there's a shortcut that they can take. However, they'll need to stop taking the known trail and make their way through the forest. It's the best thing they can do, and the men don't realize it now, but this is about to be their biggest mistake. The group make their way to the tree line, debating whether this is a good idea or not. They enter and Hutch's compass stops working. This is the first sign that something isn't right, and soon they'll wish they took the long way around. Making their way through the forest, they decide to take a break and stop for a group photo. Sometime later, the men are tired, and they can't help but think about all the food they're going to eat when they get home. Suddenly, they spot a gutted body of an animal hanging across the trees. They have no idea what it is, and realize that someone must have physically hung it up there. Luke notices that the creature is still bleeding, meaning that it must have been a fresh kill, and whoever did this might be nearby. They continue into the night, but then it starts to downpour. They ask Hutch where they're going, and he suggests they pitch tents now, and continue their journey tomorrow. That's when Luke spots a strange marking on one of the trees and calls over the group to take a look. They flash their lights beyond the tree and find an abandoned cabin behind it that definitely isn't going to have something spooky happen inside. They kick down the door and the group walks inside, but not before Luke hears some strange sounds in the distance. It's weird but the man joins his friends inside, where they find the same strange markings from the tree hanging from the ceiling. Luke tells Hutch that he doesn't want to stay here, and looks outside again to make sure that nothing is there. They tell Phil here to go find some firewood, and he heads upstairs, but as he's searching, he's startled by the sound of Dom hitting the stairs. He continues looking around, but finds himself in a strange room, and shouts for the others to come up here. The group go to see what scared him to find a human-like sculpture with no head. Freaked out, they go back downstairs to get the fire started. Okay, there's already enough going on here to tell me this is sketchy. So let's admire how many red flags the group just ignored. 
This is an old Norse nightmare they've stumbled into. I'm with Hutch. If there is a shortcut, they should take it since Dom twisted his leg. Especially if that shortcut is through an unmarked forest path. But what of the twisted leg chum? Well, they are going to a forest after all. There's so much timber to use for shelter, weapons, and a sweet chair to carry your twisted leg friend on. It's the least they could do for Dawn. Let's focus on some weapons here though, because staying safe in the spooky woods is priority number one. And since they have none outside a knife, making a spear is priority number two. This is a useful weapon with very minimal resources needed and was used up to 400,000 years ago. Most spears were made out of a combination of carved wood and stone. So if it worked against woolly mammoths, It'll definitely work against whatever's in this forest. First, you have to identify yourself a stick. Do you want a walking stick or a weapon? Fortunately, there's a lot of down trees around them. You're gonna want to make sure it's at least your height, but preferably a foot or two taller. Judging from how densely grown this forest is, the tree's leaf structure, they are surrounded by spruce. Over 40% of all trees in Scandinavia are spruce, which is a soft wood, because spruce has a closed pore structure inside the wood. That means when you cut it, the resin canals inside of it heal those cuts and stiffen the soon-to-be spear into a lightweight weapon. This is also the best point for them to make spears too, because wet wood is a no-go. And at this point, something I don't buy is, out of all the guys with smartphones taking selfies, no one could check to see if rain was coming beforehand. I get that international data roaming plans are a killer, but it beats an actual killer. Back to the spears. Hutch has a knife and that's all he need. Clean cuts are the most crucial part of carving a spear because it affects its balance. An effective spear is the right mix of strength and how sharp the pointy end is. Starting six inches below the end of the spear, make an indent around it. Do smooth slow motions away from you from the indent outward. Make sure to remove the bark too, otherwise it won't have any bite. This gives you that monster piercer points you want. If the group even wanted to get inventive, they could carve multiple spears for Dom to sit on and carry him to safety. Another benefit of an elevated Dom, if something is stalking the group, he would be able to see it. Remember those weapons Dom was sitting on? He and company have spears to throw and TKO the beast, but they don't do any of that. It's all about shelter. From a general survival perspective, I actually agree with the breaking and entering. Staying out in the rain means soggy socks, and that wetness could eventually lead to trench foot. And if you think Dom's twisted leg is bad, wait until you've already done the legwork for the monster by letting decay set in. But hey, you live and you learn. Sitting downstairs, Luke suggests they go back from where they came in the morning. Hudge tells them that they're fine and have enough supplies to last them the trip. All they need to do is not panic. They decide to get some rest, but as they're sleeping, Luke is woken up by something strange. He spots a bright white light outside and opens the door to find himself in the liquor store where his friend died. Suddenly, the walls open up and he finds himself back in the forest. Looking down, he sees blood on his chest and hears screaming from inside the house. He rushes inside to find Phil's disappeared, Dom's in a terrified trance, repeatedly calling out his wife's name, and Hutch has wet his pants. He walks upstairs to find their friend naked, praying at the headless figure, and demands to know what's going on. Confused, he tells him he has no idea what happened, and they decide to pack their stuff and leave immediately. Outside, they find the markings from the night before carved into every single tree around them. The men realize that this is a warning sign and someone doesn't want them here. Luke suggests they go back the way they came, but Hutch disagrees. That's when Dom spots a trail leading out of the forest and decides to take it, ignoring the warnings from Hutch and Luke. The group falls after him and Phil asks them what the hell happened in the house. Hutch explains it was a nightmare and gets frustrated at him for continuing to ask. Sometime later, they spot man-made cut stumps in the ground and figure they're closing in on civilization. That's when they pass by another seemingly abandoned shed, but don't go inside. There's something uneasy in the air, and it's coming for them. Further along the trail, Dom needs a break. The guys get angry with him, but Luke tells them he'll check what's on top of the ridge while they wait for the injured man. He runs up hill to find a disappointing surprise. There's nothing but endless trees waiting for them in every direction, and it's clear they're lost. He notices a hand wrapped around a tree in the distance slip out of view, and it terrifies Luke. He runs back to tell the others, but no one believes. He tells them something supernatural is happening in this forest and shows them the blood-stained wounds on his chest from the night before. Dom says that he doesn't believe him, and the two get into an argument. He reveals that he's always thought Luke was a coward for not doing anything at the liquor store. Luke punches him in the face and storms off while Hutch follows him, but he now realizes what his friends really think about him. Okay, haunted cabin in the woods rules start applying here. I'm ignoring anything remotely weird or creepy. That includes Phil praying naked and Luke's antler stab wounds. Priority number one would be getting the hell out of there and back to civilizations. And to his credit, Hutch says what should be the movie's tagline, keep moving southwest. Now this is where Dom Dom gets dumb dumb. Everything isn't fine. 
we've got a mysterious headless wood mannequin upstairs, runes carved into the spooky forest outside, and a friend in desperate need of a new pair of PJs. You can only ignore so many red flags before you go colorblind. So clearly, the most logical option is to go deeper into the unknown, right? Much like Luke said, hiking. These runes carved into the trees here are actually pretty interesting. Runes are the first writing system developed and used by the Norse people in ancient Scandinavia. Runes are more than letters, though, at least from how we look at language today. The mythology here, though, says that runes were discovered by Odin, father of the gods, after he hung himself for nine days and nights while on the search for higher wisdom. A rune was a letter, but it was also a symbol used to show some kind of cosmological principle or power. When a Norseman wrote a rune, it was to invoke and direct the power that that rune stood for. There's a symbol today that you might not even know came from a Norse rune, the up arrow. This comes from the letter T rune and named after the war god Tyr. He was one of the main Norse gods up there with Odin and Thor in importance, dwelling in the daytime sky, presiding over law and justice, and was used as part of spells to ensure victory in battle. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like the runes outside the cabin are good omens like this, because runes were also used to summon holy spirits and monsters. This could explain the antler markings on Luke's chest. Now call me an honorary mountain man, but I would never go hiking out to the wild unknowns without any kind of protection. Things like rope, bear mace, a knife, and a high voltage taser are all standard gear. Who needs all the essentials anyway. Well, everyone actually. More goes into hiking than a shortcut through some unknown woods you definitely didn't know existed before you needed it. Carrying the proper equipment is absolutely critical, especially when things go wrong, which they have. First aid, water, and fire are three main essentials that any hiker should have on them. Every hiker should have a first aid kit in their sack. Water is also necessary. It's recommended to have a gallon with you for every 24 hours you plan to hike. That's not always feasible though. So the general rule is a standard sized 16.9 ounce water bottle every hour. The final big hiking essential the group didn't have was some way to start a fire, be it from stormproof matches or flint. These items are lightweight, inexpensive, and don't take up much space in your hiking day pack. What makes this even crazier is that the guys have a good amount of hiking essentials. Hutch had a physical map and compass. The cell phones they don't use are helpful, but should never fully replace the map and compass. The guys also had weather appropriate clothing, insulating jackets to protect from the cold and rain, long pants to prevent cuts, and boots meant to withstand walking the terrain. Also good on them for bringing illumination. You should always bring a light source if you plan to be out after dark. The guys continue their journey, but they stop when they find a patch of fabric sticking out from the ground. Hutch cuts it open and discovers that it's a tent. Inside, they find a wallet with a credit card that expired in 1984. Realizing that they're about to suffer the same fate, Hutch tries to cheer them up by saying that the lodge they've booked is going to report the missing in five hours. The only problem is that it's getting dark again, so they're forced to stay the night. Later, Hutch approaches Luke and tells him the rest of the group isn't doing too well. Dom's knee is getting worse by the hour, and Phil's still traumatized from what happened at the house. He tells him that when morning comes, it's up to him to find help while he takes care of the group. While everyone's fast asleep, Luke hears deep growls and breaking branches from outside his tent. He unzips his tent and sees the same incident from the liquor store, watching again as Robert gets murdered right in front of him. Suddenly, he notices a creature take one of their tents away and instantly wakes up to the sound of Phil screaming. He rushes outside, noticing that Hutch's tent has been opened, but the man is nowhere to be seen. Luke opens up Dom's tent to ask where he is, but that's when they hear their friend screaming in the distance and a creature growling. The guys run into the woods following after the sounds to try and find their lost friend. Dom tells him to go back to the tents and get their bearings. Hutch is gone. The screams have stopped and they're about to find out why. They continue walking along the ridge come morning and find Hutch impaled on the tree branches with his torso completely torn open. That makes two down with three more to go. They pull him down from the tree and Luke searches his body for any clues. Dom is freaking out, but they have to leave before they're hunted down and killed too. Dom lays branches over the dead body before they continue. The men ask Luke if he's seen the creature in person and he tells them he caught a glimpse of it and it's big. Dom loses his cool and shouts out in anger, but Luke tells him to quiet down before the creature figures out where they are. Later, they find a small creek to drink water from and notice footsteps leading away. They realize there must be people hiding in the forest and decide to head the other way. Climbing up the ridge, Phil slips and falls down. Luke goes to comfort him, but startles his friend who's still having trouble forgetting what happened in the house. He drags the man back up the ridge when he spots clear sky and goes to check it out. Taking in the view, he spots the mountain they climbed earlier and realizes they've almost made it back to the trail, but in the distance are several lights in the woods. He goes back to tell his friends, but sees the creature grab Phil. 
Terrified, he tries to run and crashes straight into a tree. In all the chaos, Luke has another flashback to the liquor store. When he comes to, he looks for either of his friends, but the woods are completely empty. He turns around and spots Dom hiding behind a tree. Luke joins him on the ground, and the guy tells him that something took Phil, but it's going to come back for them. On the count of three, they start running away, but that's when they hear something behind them and realize the creature is about to catch up. They run for their lives and find themselves on a torchlit path. Searching the area, Luke finds Phil impaled on a tree, just like Hutch. That makes three down, with two more to go. They freak out, but realize they have no time to slow down. They follow the path to yet another cabin, but this one's different with signs of life. When they barge in, Luke notices an elderly woman sitting next to a vinyl player, but before he can react, they're knocked out. Later, he wakes up next to Dom, but both of them are chained and handcuffed. Digging a hole in the wall, Luke looks outside to see a bunch of strange looking people setting something up. Dom tells him that they need to leave now or else they'll be killed. He tells Luke to break the bottle on the table and use the glass to cut the ropes. The man tries using his feet to reach the bottle, but is interrupted by the villagers. An old woman walks in and offers him a drink. He doesn't know what it is, but drinks it anyways. She then pulls his shirt down to reveal the wound and shows him that she has the exact same markings on her chest. The old woman walks over to Dom with the cup, but she turns away and gives orders to the guards. They immediately go and chain Dom and drag him upstairs. Luke sits helpless while he hears his friend screaming for his life. That's when this blonde woman walks in and covers Luke's ears, explaining the guards are preparing a sacrifice before the man blacks out. Later, he wakes up from a nap to see the guards bring Dom back. Luke asks him if he's alright, but Dom can't think of anything but to tell him about the nightmare he had in the house. He imagined a creature gripping him and a vision of his wife. Realizing that he's going to die, the man tells Luke to burn this place down and run away, but gives him one final request. Tell his wife that he tried to come back. The guards take Dom outside and prop him up on a stake. A loud roar echoes through the trees, and the pagans bow down to the creature that's about to arrive. Meanwhile, Luke agonizingly slips his hand out of the rope handcuffs. Okay, so this is where we finally start to see some reason come back into the chaos. Luke didn't listen to Dom about the glass initially, but he does now. He's alone and has an escape route. You might have missed that handy dandy window just hanging out in the window there. This is Luke's opportunity to escape, and when you're dealing with a bunch of pagans ready to sacrifice you, there might not be a lot of opportunities for that. But what if your hands are tied behind your back like Luke? All it takes is some twisting and persistence. Squat down and step over your hands to get them in front of you. Rope is made of natural fibers like straw and they stretch. So the first thing to do to escape is stretch the rope by twisting your wrists back and forth. To loosen the knot, bring your wrists as close as possible with your hands being in front of you. Now you can even use your teeth to help. Once you've done all of that, you just move your hands in an up and down motion until the knot and rope unravel. What if none of that works? Sharp objects work great now and Dom came in clutch with the suggestion to break the bottle and use it to cut the ropes. Rubbing ropes against the pointed glass end, the former of a wall or desk or even the strike plate of a doorway are all great ways to free yourself. He breaks a thumb to slip out. Rope, handcuffs, zip ties, and duct tape are designed to fit around the smallest part of your wrist, so you have to make your hand that size to slip out. Realistically, Luke would have had to break his thumb, index, and pinky fingers to have the flexibility for that kind of escape. Waiting for the beast, Dom sees his wife in the distance and starts saying her name over and over again like in the cabin. She walks towards him and grabs his face, but everything is not as it seems. The creature actually grabs Dom and moves him onto a tree, impaling the man. That makes four victims down, with only one more to go. The blonde woman comes back to Luke, and he asks if Dom has been taken off the tree. She tells him they don't move the bodies, and reveals that the creature is a Jotun, a nameless spawn of the Norse god Loki that they worship, and in exchange for immortality, the pagans must provide human sacrifices. Luke's ritual is next, and since he's marked, he'll be forced to kneel before the god to become one of them, or suffer the same fate as his friends. When she leaves, he paces around the room, gathering the courage to escape. He walks out, stopping briefly in front of a supply room complete with the guns. He sees the old woman walking in, and he heads upstairs to hide. Hidden upstairs are rows of what appear to be mummified remains, all worshipping a central figure. Luke takes a torch and lights them on fire one by one. Okay, can we talk about the monster for a sec? We learn that the hill people call it a Jotun, but it's more specifically a Jotnar, a race of godlike giants. In many Scandinavian languages, Moder means mother, and in Old Norse, it translates to anger or grief. This beast is an obscure Jotun that was worshipped by a group of cultists in exchange for unnaturally long lives, and just a bit of human sacrifice to show their dedication. Like many pagan deities, Moder is unforgiving and demanding, and that's best shown through her interaction with her cult. Like any good god, though, Moder has mercy, if you're a devotee, and pledge to her loyalty that make a Labrador 
jealous. But there could be a more gruesome creature that Motor is based off of, the Knuckleby. It's a mythical sea creature that turns into a horse-like demon when it's on land. This landform has fin-like appendages, no legs, a gaping mouth, two heads, and a man's torso attached to it, with its breath alone wilting crops and killing livestock, and when on land, it was responsible for epidemics and drought. If you ever run into a Nekulavi, you can escape it by simply crossing a stream to the other bank. So what we've got here is a creepy combo of Nekulavi, Odin, and Jotun lore, built into the body of a massive humanoid Musel. This mix of myth and nightmare results in one of the best movie monsters in years, even more reason now for Luke to have tamed this riderless demon. Luke walks downstairs to see the old woman staring at him, so he punches her in the face. He then grabs a gun from the supply room and hears people screaming from outside. The man is about to escape when a pagan tries to stop him, and he shoots him in cold blood before sprinting out of the burning building, taking an axe with him. As the cabin becomes fully engulfed in fire, Luke can now see the creature choking the blonde woman between its hands. The man takes one look and decides to shoot at it. This was a bad idea, and the creature drops the body to focus on him. Injured, he limps away from the danger, while the creature runs after him. Looking around, he recognizes a familiar scene, and notices the store lights in the liquor store appear behind him. He decides to follow the lights, and runs away from the creature, but he's too slow. The man gets knocked over, but notices an opening out of the forest, and tries to head for safety. But suddenly, the creature picks him up. It looks as if it's going to impale him on a tree, but instead it puts him down. It starts speaking a strange language, and Luke tries to escape, but gets pushed down into a kneeling position before he has a chance to run away. Way. Okay, this is where Luke has his final girl moment. Burning down the chapel will do the job, but that's the safe option. The remaining pagans are all but dead, the reanimated bodies are burned, and the necromancer priest went up in smoke. In ancient Norse mythology, this was all a blood sacrifice to be on good terms with the gods. You always want to be on good terms with the gods, whether fertility or luck in battle depended on it. One of the more common blood sacrifices used was by the Vikings, who hung animals and humans in holy groves named after the Allfather. Use of Odin's name itself was sacred, so it was reserved for significant places. Odinsholt in Denmark is one of these places. Odinsholt is a shortened version of Odin's Holt, meaning Odin's Wood. The cult that practiced here worshipped Odin and hung both animals and people. Odin was the god of the upper classes and was mainly worshipped by Magnus, a pagan priest, and warriors. A human life was the most valuable sacrifice that could be made to the gods. The gods gift humans with life, so repaying it back to them through sacrifice was a big deal. Getting back to Luke, he's already done the work. Why not reap the benefits and actually ask Motor for something now? While the celestial can do what it wants in the woods, it's still bound by customs, sacrifices, and rituals. This is shown when it forces Luke to bow to it. He should ask Motor to make a world where everyone's alive and he can live free from the horror that's happened. He can forget he's responsible for his friend dying under the liquor store fluorescence. Every scream he heard is now gone. Even the gods kids have some capacity for compassion, and this Jotun has shown that it isn't any different. It was just doing what the cult people asked of it. Having this paradise seems like a way better option than pain. Looking over, Luke sees the injured body of Robert staring at him, but that's when the creature takes its hands off him. Luke here gets up and stabs it in the midsection with the axe, giving him enough time to run away. He finally makes it out of the forest and watches as the creature roars at him, but can't seem to follow him outside the woods. As the sun rises, Luke walks off with an even heavier weight than he went in with and has learned a valuable lesson. Never take a trip to Sweden. But what do you think? How would you beat the ritual? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, check out the how to be playlist for more videos like this, and don't forget that from now on, we'll be uploading on Wednesdays and Saturdays. Until next time, have a damn good day.